Okay, so the max I can take is six My name is Deanna Kerrigan, and I'm a professor at George Washington University, and I direct the social and behavioral sciences core of the DC Center for AIDS Research. It's a pleasure to have everybody together today in recognition of World AIDS Day. And we have a panel discussion focused on NIH supported collaborative research in light of the current PEPFAR dynamics. The first thing I want to do is to thank our hosts at American University, particularly Dean and Shannon Hayter, for inviting us to be here together. Um, and I also want to acknowledge members of the planning team, Nina Yamanas, Allison Corbett, Wendy Davis, Allison O'Rourke, a lot of effort went into planning. To acknowledge our CIFAR director, Alan Greenbart, for his support, and Julie Kulowitz, who is the co-lead of the Global Scientific Interest Group of the CIFAR, that is co-sponsoring the event along with the Social and Behavioral Sciences Corps. Um, I also just want to take a moment to recognize and ground us in the symbolism of World AIDS Day. This is the 35th World AIDS Day. It started in 1988. And it's a moment really to reflect on those that we've lost to AIDS-related illnesses. That's over 40 million people to date since the start of the pandemic. It's a moment to recognize people living with HIV and what they are facing in terms of stigma, discrimination, and violence in many situations. But it's also a moment to reflect on resilience and our ability to come together and collectively confront the HIV pandemic and to really consider, you know, what are the gaps in the global HIV response? And I think that is really what we're here to do today. So I also want to take a moment to just say a few words about the DCC bar our mission and the resources that we have to offer faculty and staff and students among nine participating institutions across DC. So our mission is to advance, so make sure everybody's seeing that, multi-institutional research and contribute to ending the HIV epidemic both in DC um, as well as beyond DC, including globally. Um, and as you see here, there are just there are nine institutions that include academic institutions, community partners, government partners across the city. Um, and this is really unique. Almost no other CFAR in the country has this type of a meaningful and equitable partnership across all these different types of institutions. And so almost 300 investigators across those institutions are coming together to put their, their collective efforts to end the pandemic. This is just a glance at some of the activities that the DCC for sponsors uh, to stimulate research, particularly NIH supported research in high priority areas, to offer pilot awards and mentoring, particularly to early and new investigators. Um, and here I'll talk in a moment about the different resources that we have in terms of pilot awards and different forms of awards that help folks gather preliminary data to be able to develop their own proposals. And this is really multidisciplinary. This is from the social behavioral sciences to the clinical and biomedical sciences, really across domains and disciplines that we're doing this work. Um, and one thing we want to do, in addition to supporting independent investigator initiatives, is to think collectively and collaboratively um, within institutions and across institutions. So hopefully today is an opportunity to think about how do we spark that collaboration and, and really combine our efforts. And another unique thing, of course, the DC CIFAR is its emphasis on community and community-engaged research. And to make visible the work that we're all doing in this effort. So briefly, one of the things that the DC CIFAR does both um, twice a year in the fall and in the spring is it puts out a request for applications around pilot awards. And these are often between 50 and $75,000. And that allows new um, junior investigators to have the resources to collect their own preliminary data to support their development of HIV-related proposals, as well as to garner mentoring and consultation through the CFAR. So please look out for those. Please become a member of the CFAR so that we can have you on our listserv and make sure that you're hearing about those opportunities. Additionally, there are opportunities for folks who might be more senior, more advanced in their career, but potentially haven't worked in the HIV domain. And we want to bring you into the fold and leverage your expertise and have you be part of a collaborative effort for the DCC CAR. So those are often called transitioning investigator awards. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned, the importance of community. 
We have opportunities for community-based organizations and academic organizations to co-PI or really co-lead uh, grant opportunities and collect the data they might need to put in um, a joint proposal. So these are just some examples of the types of awards and programs that the DCCR offers. So as we reflect on today's conversation, please be thinking to yourself um, if there's some preliminary data you might want to gather um, and that these awards might be helpful to you in that process. So now I'm going to turn to introduce our esteemed panel. I'm going to start with Dean Shannon Hader. So Dr. Hader uh, is the Dean of the School of International Service at American University, and she started there in June 2022. She was formerly the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Deputy Executive Director of the program at UNAIDS. And she also served as the Director of the Division of Global HIV and TB at CDC, and as Vice President and Director of Future International, now Palladium. She's also been a senior deputy director of HIV, hepatitis, STD, and TB administration for DC Health, as well as a senior scientific advisor to PEPFAR in the Department of State. Next, we have Dr. Peter Kilmarx, who is the acting director of Fogarty International Center at the National Institutes of Health. He's also the acting associate director for international research at NIH. He joined Fogarty as deputy director in 2015 and assumed his current role in January of 2023. He has led analysis in the NIH global health activity space and built coalitions um, between NIH and other external stakeholders, which have been critical, including building capacity for pandemic preparedness. He is a rear admiral and assistant surgeon general in the US Public Health Service and has held numerous positions with CDC, including country director in Zimbabwe. And speaking of Zimbabwe, we have Dr. Godfrey Wolk, who is the Director of Global Implementation Research at the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. He leads and provides technical assistance and management oversight and strategic thinking to all things implementation science at the foundation. Um, prior to the foundation, he was a senior research epidemiologist at RTI, or Research Triangle Institute. And prior to that, he was 20 years at the University of Zimbabwe Medical School, the Professor of Epidemiology and Chair of the Department of Community Medicine. So we have a very experienced and esteemed panel, and I welcome them and thank them in advance for their time and look forward to this conversation. And I will hand it over to Dr. Peter. All right. Well, thank you. Sorry. Thank you, and uh, welcome, everybody. We're really excited to have you here in our home. Um, I'm charged with giving a little bit of a background on this uh, PEPFAR in limbo uh, kind of tagline we used uh, as an introduction here. And uh, first, just want to add my thoughts and my um, thanks for World AIDS Day. You know, World AIDS Day is not exactly considered a day of celebration. Uh, we consider it a, a day of commemoration and commitment and recommitment. And so uh, commemoration of lives lost, but also lives dedicated. Um, and especially among people living with HIV all across the world who have uh, over time uh, dedicated so much heart, soul, time, expertise, and effort to make the world a better place. Um, and that to me is always really important for rededicating to what's left to do. Because even though we've made tremendous progress, there are huge amounts of work left to do. Uh, not the least of which, um, really recognizing that not everyone has benefited equally from the interventions we have to date. Uh, children are actually the highest disparity group in terms of treatment coverage and access, and we've got a lot more to do on that, as well as uh, prevention and treatment for youth and key populations. So got to go home and think about what's next, right? But maybe ascending the scene, you know. A uh, little bit of background, I think most people in the room know what PEPFAR is, but maybe highlighting a few elements of it um, that are really, truly remarkable as setting the stage for and why has PEPFAR so, been so relevant to research. Um, PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which was originally sort of announced in George W. Bush's uh, 2003 State of the Union um, and funded um, by, for FY 2004, so less than nine months after it's being announced, um, has been pretty remarkable. Um, prior to COVID, it's been considered the single biggest investment of any country in a single disease in the history of our Earth. Um, and I think the results, uh, you know, get 
cited a lot. And sometimes it's typical to talk about, you know, the biggest results as being, you know, over $100 billion spent to date in the bilateral PEPFAR program. Uh, the standing it up alongside the stand up of the global fund and as long the stand up of the WHO three by five initiative. So that could all pull together. Uh, a lot of times we talk about, you know, PEPFARS, 25 million lives saved, millions and millions of preve infections prevented, the global broader contribution to over 30 million people in the world today on life-saving HIV treatment. Um, sometimes we cite it because of innovation. There has been nothing but change over the course of PEPFAR in the way the world sort of does business for HIV, uh, you know, going from 20 pills a day, five different times, very unforgiving to one combination pill once a day, uh, going from over $9,000 per person per year at a discount rate for a course of treatment to less than $70 per person per year. Uh, for better treatment today, just lots of big innovations. Um, but to me, the number one accomplishment or result of PEPFAR has been leadership. Um, the amount of technical, clinical, programmatic leadership across the world, the amount of uh, political leadership and community leadership across the world, um, the amount of research leadership that you're going to hear more about today, to me, that is the single most transformative change um, that's happened over the past 20 years. And interestingly enough, PEPFAR, and especially the first uh, iteration of PEPFAR, um, pretty much expressly prohibited the expenditure of the new PEPFAR dollars on research. It was made very, very clear that the initial budget was not for research. There was a lot of fear, I think, from Congress at the time that we're going to appropriate these new monies. And I think the first dose was uh, uh, 15, $14 billion over three years, uh, over five-year period was the original sort of size of the program because... It was in response to an absolute lack of treatment and evidence-based prevention around the world at scale. And there was such devastation of life in highly affected countries. Um, and there was a lot of, I have to say, there was a lot of unknowns on how do you re roll out this complex treatment at scale all over the world. Um, appropriators were a little bit afraid that the um, experts would be, spend so much time looking at their toes and researching that nobody would get a single pill. And so they said, you know, this is about going out and implementing programs and figuring out to do it. Um, but I'll make the argument of setting this up that that programmatic building, that infrastructure investment, that expertise creation has absolutely radically changed the context for HIV research around the world. Um, you know, when I was... Uh, uh, working at CDC in my sort of first iteration, just a few years in, my boss um, sent me to Kusumu uh, because CDC was setting up an HIV vaccine unit in Kusumu, a highly uh, affected uh, community in Western Kenya, uh, longstanding research field station with Kemri, uh, the Kenya Medical Research Institute and US CDC. Um, and so I went out to do a little TDY and I was being asked, okay, if we do a youth vac a, you know, HIV vaccine, youth preparatory cohort, what do we need to set up for um, ethical services for those participating in the program or in the research program? And I got there and I find, found out, um, you know, CDC had been doing with Kemri household, uh, routine household disease surveillance and health surveillance for about 20 years, I think already by then. Um, so they went to a number of households around the community um, at least once a year, if not multiple times a year to check in on health and things like that. And I found out that during that time, the very dedicated Kenyan and, and American researchers had tried to sort of build in, you know, what can what, what what can we give people who are participating? You know, if there aren't programs at scale here for a lot of things, what can we bring to them and, you know, sort of hook into the excuse of research to deliver, whether it's for iron deficiency or this, that, and the other thing. And again, being a little bit young and then I was like, oh, that's really weird because there was then no connection between the research unit and actually the um, local jurisdictional ministry or programs or services. There was just they're almost completely separate. So they were being delivered in isolation without any sort of change in the infrastructure or services of the community. Um, and so I was asked, okay, this is the HIV vaccine cohort research that we're trying to set up. You know, Shannon, you know, treatment, you know, prevention services. What, what do we need to um, give to the teenagers, essentially, who sign up to be part of the study? Um, 
And I looked at it and I looked at the numbers and I said, hmm, so when I'm looking at the sample size here, it looks like you're going to be touching nearly 50% of the teenagers in the community and enrolling at least one out of four of them for this long-term cohort study. And I said, well, you don't need to give anything to the people in the study. What you need to do is to make services that are going to be available for every single teenager in this community <laughs> that, yes, you can link your study people to them, but to be non-coercive, to be ethical, what you really need to do at that scale is you need scale ser services for everyone. I don't think my boss liked that answer, but um, you know, I think it was a prelude to fast forward. The uh, uh, What was executed in sort of scaling up programmatic services in highly affected countries was transformational, not just for the lives affected immediately, but for the research and ability to collaborate on research. Um, you know, one of our transformative studies um, in HIV innovation, um, HPTN 052, that in 2011 became the basis for treatment as prevention. Um, you know, Zimbabwe and one of our dear friends and colleagues, Professor Hakim, um, who passed away from COVID during the early epidemic, um, he was the PI for Harare. Um, and they were, I think, eight you know, sites all around the world, including the US, including Africa, including Asia, have been a lot of work on like, how do we even get these drugs? But once PEPFAR came, it wasn't just about having treatment drugs for people in the study. It was knowing that there was infrastructure for ongoing treatment, that it wasn't your only way to get treatment for HIV was to join a study. And I think it really led to these transformative results and collaboration. So where are we now? PEPFAR. Um, you might have read some of the headlines. You might have not. Uh, PEPFAR is special in other ways um, that are very wonky. For anyone who hears SIS, we like wonky policy stuff. Um, but one of the things that's incredibly unique about PEPFAR as a global health program is it has authorizing language from the U.S. Con Congress, authorizing language that sets this up as a U.S. government program um, and included some requirements that were very transformational and are still fairly controversial, I would say. Um, probably one of the most controversial things is it actually set up the State Department and the AIDS coordinator, ambassador at large for uh, global AIDS, as the authority to coordinate a whole of USG global HIV response, meaning any agency that got any dollars for HIV implementation overseas had to actually be accountable to this coordinator. And accountable meaning they couldn't spend their money they got if it was in their budget or not without sign off from this person in the State Department, which brings in a lot of controversy about authorities and autonomy and how things work together. But it was transformational. I think the second thing um, that's important to know about it. it. You know, the authorizing language is then matched by budget, right? So authorizing and appropriations are two separate things. You have authorizing language that has the governance and the commitment and the legal basis, and then you have your budget that gets sent to that program over time. Um, and the authorizing language and the setup includes, yes, the PEPFAR direct bilateral expenditures. It also includes um, certain amounts of money for the global fund. So the multilateral uh, expenditures. So that also was a way of bringing people together who believe in both multilateral and bilateral aid versus picking one or the other. Third thing that was really unique is it has very huge commitments to transparent reporting metrics. Um, and my personal belief is the reason that we had now gone through the initial authorizing and three reauthorizations every five years over the past 20 years is in part because of the transparency, because the accountability was so clear where the money was going, what was and wasn't being accomplished, wasn't about perfection, but there was no mystery. You could see the lives being set, saved. You could see the things being tried out. And that gave a lot of confidence to Congress people to continue to rededicate to this. Um, now, fast forward, um, some of you probably noticed, um, we've missed reauthorization. Um, the current authorization expired on September 30th, 2023. Um, and this puts us in a very unsteady place. Um, does it mean that money shuts off tomorrow? No, because budget and authorization or appropriations authorization are different things. However, I would say, some people say, ah, oh, it doesn't matter at all. We don't need new authorization. We, we can just keep getting budget. 
I would, I would argue that history and history, let's say from the domestic Ryan White program, um, would argue that not reauthorizing is a really um, bad sign for future appropriations. Um, la the last reauthorization of our domestic Ryan White Act for HIV was in 2013. Um, the Ryan White Act then received no increases in appropriations whatsoever until COVID and the ending the HIV epidemic initiative under the Trump administration sort of in parallel with COVID. And if you look at the current budget now, um, it's about half in real dollars what it was in 2013, because there hasn't been any keeping up with inflation. So it's not a good thing to not have everybody behind your reauthorization. Um, there are a lot of reasons that we can talk about, about why reauthorization is more problematic and troublesome and has hung up so far this year. I think the latest headlines that you will see is um, it's been escalated to a fight over reproductive health and abortion services. Um, if we get a chance to talk about it, I'll say, I don't think that was the core thing causing the delay, <laughs> but it's now become its own big thing. Um, we can talk about how PEPFAR has never spent money on abortion services. We can talk about how there is other um, legislation that prohibits the expenditure of U.S. foreign dollar or U.S. dollars for um, abortions abroad. None of that has changed at all. Um, but this has become um, a sticking point and a political point by um, a specific groups in Congress um, that was particularly um, sort of made more fraught when the Susan B. Anthony Foundation decided to score a, a vote for reauthorizing PEPFAR as a vote for abortion rights. So we can talk a little bit about what the off ramps to that are. I think there's still huge commitment to getting a clean five-year reauthorization. Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who is really part of the founders of PEPFAR through the Congressional Black Caucus is advocating for a clean five-year reauthorization. There's some discussions about, well, maybe we get a one-year authorization, or maybe we get clean authorization with more rigid reporting requirements in the report language. Um, and then I think other than that, there's also always opportunities when something like this happens to say, okay, does the reauthorization get folded into omnibus appropriations legislation? Does it get folded into um, continuing resolutions so that it's part of a whole package of things being signed off of and it can't be scored as a standalone vote. So it's a little limbo we're in right now um, and I'll hand it off. Wonderful, thank you. I, I'm truly delighted to be here. I've actually um, interacted with, worked with everybody on the panel. But I won't say that my first reaction was absolutely, I'd be happy to participate uh, as a government official to come and talk about the politics of PEPFAR. I was a little bit hesitant, but I was assured that others on the panel would be having that discussion and would really just share my own perspective and from the NIH and from the Fogarty International Center. Um, so I was asked just to give a, a brief on NIH and Fogarty, and I think most of you are aware of this, but the U.S. National Institutes of Health is the biggest funder of biomedical and behavioral health research in the world. The 23 budget was $45 billion. There's 27 different institutes and centers. You're probably all familiar with the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And essentially for every kind of disease category and organ system and population, there's an institute or center for that. The Fogarty International Center is the smallest um, in terms of staffing and budget of the 27 institutes and centers. But we have a big mission. We uh, support all the other uh, parts of NIH and their global international work. And then with our uh, funding, we focus on training and capacity building in lower income countries. Uh, we're celebrating our 55th year this year. Um, John E. Fogarty was actually a bow tie wearing Rhode Islander um, congressman like myself. So I, I didn't know that before I came to Fogarty. So I was pretty happy to learn about uh, John E. Fogarty, who was a, a bricklayer, the head of the bricklayers union in Rhode Island uh, and became a congressman. And I and, uh, was a big proponent for NIH and for, for international collaboration. But NIH is really a global enterprise. We did an analysis a few years ago and of all of the 70, 80,000 publications per year, 
funded by NIH, 35% of them have a non-US affiliated co-author. So it's very global. And those publications have a higher scientific impact factor than the publications that are US authors only. So there's a lot of, lot of global collaboration and uh, high impact work that's being done uh, by the NIH. So uh, there's been, so to talk about how really the PEPFAR um, interactions with the NIH research, and I would definitely echo what, sh what Shannon said, it really created the framework to be able to um, do, for example, an HIV vaccine study, what happens to the people who become HIV positive and to say, oh, we'll just refer them to our friendly neighborhood PEPFAR site um, just makes it a lot more ethical and practical to go ahead with that kind of that kind of research. Just as an example, um, just one other thing to comment on the HPTN 052 study. Uh, if you look at the well, one thing about it is uh, Mike Cohen, who was the PI, said without the global sites, the study would still be going on. Basically, you know, the, the very important for the U.S. taxpayer to have that kind of globalization going on. But then also, if you look at the sites, um, uh, many or most of the um, site PIs were former Fogarty trainees. So we were we were very involved, not directly in the in the in the funding administration, but in the capacity building that went into that that uh, that kind of work. But there's been some really important um, implementation research studies that were funded by PEPFAR um, in collaboration with with the NIH. The search study, uh, sustainable East Africa research and community health, um, the pop art study and the Botswana Combination Prevention uh, Project. These were all using treatment as prevention and other prevention interventions at scale um, to, to evaluate those and, and, and supported and funded um, by, by in part, at least in part by PEPFAR. Um, also with Fogarty, um, one of our, our key goals is around implementation research and one activity has been the Adolescent HIV Implementation Science Alliance, um, which was supported in part by PEPFAR. And uh, we have other ideas about how uh, we could work with PEPFAR to, uh, to support implementation research and implementation research training and capacity building. So that's been a, a very productive relationship. But the other intersections um, in support from PEPFAR for Fogarty that have been have really transformational they, we started in 2010 with the MEPI program. This was working with Eric Goosby, who was the PEPFAR coordinator at that time. That's the Medical Education Partnership Initiative. This was over five years, $100 million from PEPFAR, um, working in 12 countries in Africa, really transforming the medical education landscape. Um, new curricula, new faculty, um, many more people being trained, um, including because we at NIH were implementing it, uh, research training as uh, and research opportunities as part of that, uh, but really a transformational activity in, the, in those 12 countries where, where uh, we were implementing MEPI. And then that's been followed on by HEPI. Um, the EPI brand was strong, so we, we, st we stuck with that. There was also in parallel with MEPI, there was a NEPI nursing education, and then the two were combined in HEPI as the Health Professional Education Partnership Initiative. That's still ongoing. Um, we focused with that on eight countries that have high HIV prevalence and uh, lower resources, um, but continuing um, with now interprofessional training, that uh, that transformative uh, medical education, health professional education activity. And just lastly to mention, um, out of MEPI, the, the uh, principal investigators uh, became very well networked. So there's now um, PEPFAR funding through Fogarty to a, an organization called AFRICA, which is a Pan-African uh, advocacy and, and coordinating organization of educators and researchers in, uh, in HIV and more broadly. So it's it's been really a, a fantastic partnership and support from PEPFAR for some key things that NIH has been able to, to implement and support. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. And let me just take this opportunity to thank CIFA and uh, for inviting me to, <clears throat> excuse me, and talk as part of this panel today on a very important subject, <clears throat> which is PEPFAR, um, and where we are with that. Excuse me. So 
Uh, you've already heard from Shannon, uh, Dr. Hader, as to the origins of PEPFAR and uh, some of the impacts. And, you know, it's had an investment as has already been mentioned of $110 billion, which is a huge amount and has saved all these millions of people all over the world. But one of the things which, one of the impacts of PEPFAR, which is perhaps less well known, is the fact that it has in many of, in most of the countries that it's been operating in, has strengthened health systems hugely. I mean, the difference is, between, is night and day as well as implementation science. Um, and it, I, I think the contribution that PREPA has done to this cannot be overstated at all. And as we all know that health systems strengthening is a collection or health systems is a collection of strategies and activities that improve a health systems, a country's health systems performance. And the health system includes uh, people, institution, resources, and activities that promote, restore, and maintain health. And PEPFAR strategies, in fact, included not only the drugs and getting people onto treatment and so on, but workforce training. Um, has he's, uh, Peter's just been talking about that. Capacity building, laboratory development, equipment, health equity, sustainability, partnerships, and I'll come back to partnerships a little bit later, and science-guided programs. Again, I'll come to that a, a little bit later, very important aspect. And so far, just a few statistics. PEFAR has trained more than 340,000 health, healthcare workers, invested in thousands of laboratories, um, invested in 70,000 healthcare facilities, supported, and um, we know this, supported antiretroviral treatment for 20 million, over 20 million people, enabled five and a half million infants to be born HIV free, HIV free, and led to 60, nearly 70, nearly 65 million people receiving HIV testing services. So huge, huge contribution. <clears throat> but to get back to health system strengthening, one of the important aspects as we're talking about research and data here is data quality. Quality of data is really critical in effectively monitoring and evaluating programs, as well as for implementation research. And of course, for transparency purposes, again, PEPFAR needed to demonstrate and therefore it needed to focus on uh, ways of showing that. And that's where you get data quality as being really important. And so, one example of how PEPFAR's focus on data quality through routine quality data assessments, RDQs, RDQAs, has improved data quality, um, in particularly in electronic medical records, and I'm going to show a slide on this briefly, uh, has, and this example has come from Kenya, where it has shown where in this um, in this manuscript, they demonstrated in the study uh, published by, by Muthi in 2018, they had 27 health facilities in Kenya, uh, and they looked at 2,369 records and 2,355 2, records uh, for, between the baseline, at baseline and at follow-up for the RDQAs, respectively. The time between baseline and follow-up observations range from six to 12 months. And the frequency of missing data in the EMR declined from the baseline, which was 31% missing. And we all know how terrible missing data is. Um, to the follow-up at the follow-up after doing these routine data quality assessments and not to my colleague here from uh, monitoring and evaluate SINE, um, and showed that was 13% at follow-up. So it went from 31% to 13% missing data through this process. And certainly on adjustment for facility characteristics, because of course they had hospitals and health centers and so on, they had to adjust for that. Um, the records from the follow-up had a, a point. 0.4 times the risk 
So half the risk, basically, half the odds of having at least one missing value from among the nine required data elements compared to the records in the baseline. And again, using a scale on a, a with one point awarded for each 20 data elements with concordant values in paper records in the EMR, data concordance improved from baseline to follow-up with the mean concordance increasing by uh, one, well, nearly two, two times better in terms of data, co uh, data concordance. And so the emphasis on and improvements in data quality also reflects the concern with science-based programming. PEPFAR needed to show how taxpayer money was being used. Obviously, uh, everybody was screwed. There's a lot of money. People are scrutinizing it. Where does it go? What's happening to it? Um, and at the same time, develop ev evidence-based solutions to problems inhibiting improvements in programs. This then stimulated additional investments, interest, and growth in research and evaluation methods of design, implementation, and evaluation research. Even though, and it still is in the language of PEPFAR, no research, the fact of the matter is you could not do effect, one cannot do effective programming unless you have research to uh, identify approaches to remove the bottlenecks and the problems. They go together. That's just the nature of things. Um, but it's still the language that is problematic, I can tell you, from having to, to do that, but still. Um, and so because of the need for carrying out implementation, evaluation, research, then you need people to do that. You need researchers to do that. Again, and uh, Peter has mentioned that, but Fogarty was really important to train, identify and train people. And again, this is what has happened. So through these initiatives at country level, individuals have been capacitated in implementation science, uh, science research and evaluation through PEPFAS supported programs. Again, huge thing. Um, and this together has become part of a robust platform together with lab development, equipment, and uh, other investments on which NIH collaborative research and implementation can be undertaken. So you have the people who've been capacitated, the equipment, the facilities, and so on, the labs that have all been strengthened to be able to do this. And, and this is, as I said, it's not as well publicized, but this has been probably one of the longest lasting impacts of PEPFAR in the countries that have received the support. It also means that US funded researchers, because I know a lot of US taxpayers will say, wow, that's for them, what about us? Here, yeah, we, we have needs as well. US uh, funded researchers can form partnership with these researchers in developing countries, uh, in the countries that are, were affected, have be benefited from PEPFAR, and build on the knowledge and on the science, which then can also go back and benefit uh, uh, populations within the US. So it's not a zero-sum game. It's a win-win situation for in this regard. And so, these partnerships then have the, the, the possibility and not only the, have happened of mutually beneficial research. And we end up in this virtuous cycle where you have research that's uh, identifying ways and strategies to overcome problems. And these problems are then improved and the programs are improved. So you have this uh, virtuous cycle that's happening as well. The lack of reauthorization of PEMFAR places all of this at risk. Yes, right now, the as uh, Shannon mentioned already, the budget is still there and ongoing and so on. But one of the things that 
does affect it more than anything else, in addition to that, is it creates a climate of uncertainty and erodes trust in the PEPAR program by the recipient countries. Trust, it erodes trust in the US and saying, you're going to help us and do this, and now you're not. And things like intangibles, like uncertainty and trust, are very, once you lose them, it's very difficult to build them back again. Um, and so that is a, a really, really crucial issue. But I want to say that we all know the immense progress that has been made in containing HIV. And overall, among adults and children globally, the number of new infections has declined. And I'm just going to show a quick slide on this. Uh, oh, there we are. New infections has declined from a peak of 3 million in the mid-1990s to nearly half of that in 2022. Um, there's still work to do. We have to, we're still far away from our target of getting to 500,000 new infections by 2025. Deaths have more than halved um, during this time from a peak of 2 million globally in the mid 2000s to 500,000 in 2022. We still need to get to 300,000 deaths by 2025. I can tell you personally, being from Zimbabwe in the mid 2000s, we knew people who died. Um, what I call my sister-in-law um, comes from a family of like 11 and there's three of them left. Most of them died because of HIV AIDS. And this was in an era where at the time it was a death sentence. It wasn't a death sentence that you were gonna die tomorrow, but you were gonna die in five years, seven years, because there was no treatment until PEPFAR came and delivered that. That was the scale of the problem. When I came to the US to do my PhD, I, I didn't want to do anything in HIV because I said, I'm sick and tired of this HIV. But I just, so I didn't, because I said, I also know that when I go back, that is the biggest public health problem. I'll be doing work on that anyway. So it, it, that was the scale. I. I Outside of the gay community in the US, I think most Americans do not understand, do not fully grasp the impact that HIV had on individuals at an individual level. It, it was, it was anyway, we still have a way to go in, in terms of that. One of the areas that has also been lagging is that of children. ART coverage, and can we have the next slide? ART coverage um, in children is, <clears throat> since, um, yeah. So children, the decline in new infections has slowed to about 10,000. Was doing quite well, as you can see in this graph, and now it's flattened out. And we still are struggling to move the needle a bit more in terms of children infection. In addition, ART coverage in children is at 57%, significantly lower than the 77% ART coverage in adults. And 62%, that is nearly two thirds of children living with HIV who are not on antiretroviral therapy are estimated to be aged five to 14 years. Now, that is significant because in that middle child age group, where do you, how do you find them? Where do you find, how do you get hold of them? It's, it's a challenge. And so clearly significant challenges remain in order for us to get to epidemic control of HIV and, and AIDS. And, NIH collaborative research and implementation science is needed now more than ever to be able to get us there by 2030. And the PEPFAR limbo status is jeopardizing this goal significantly. So thank you. Hi, everyone. 
I'm Nina Yamanis. I'm um, co-director of the Social and Behavioral Sciences Corps at the DC Center for AIDS Research. I'm also assistant dean here in the School of International Service at AU. Um, I just really want to thank our panelists again um, for their excellent remarks and say it's an honor to be sitting up here with them today. So thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to kick off our Q&A. I have a couple questions and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, but first, I want to start on with something that you all touched on um, with a, a little story, uh, which is that two we I've been working in Tanzania since 2006, and I'm part of the Fogarty-funded Implementation Science Network in Tanzania. And I was on a call two weeks ago with, with my colleagues, and I asked, you know, has anyone talked about what's happening with PEPFAR in Tanzania? And, you know... Are, are you all concerned or what are you doing? Um, and there was silence on the other end. And, and then finally someone spoke up and said, you know, it's really hard to talk about. And, um, and they brought up the fact that they had been talking with some youth about it a week before and that people just started crying. And they said, what if I can't get my meds? These were HIV affected youth. Um, so my first question is, what happens if PEPFAR goes away? What, what, what are the options? What does it mean for the affected countries? And what does it mean for research? And any of you who are excited to, to take that on first are welcome. <laughs> okay. I love being an academic. I can say whatever I want. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's uncertainty and, and I wouldn't, you know, understate what Godfrey mentioned that uncertainty start, starts with a, a break of trust, a breach of trust. And that's huge. Um, you know, it, when I, I was at CDC, part of the initial collaboration with the Zimbabwe Ministry of Health a church related hospital, civil society, and the rollout of ARV treatment in Zimbabwe, 2003 to 2006, the very first sort of startup. And under my first year of deployment, and we're going out and talking to not just the National Ministry of Health, but the um, the city um, health officials in Harare and, and Bulawayo, um, I was, you know, really enthusiastic and excited, like, finally, finally, we can, you know, work with you to figure out how to, how to get the resources and roll out what you need. And I was met with huge suspicion um, and not a, a very strong sense of collaboration. This was a year before PETFAR was announced when we started having these discussions. And, you know, it took me a little bit to learn. I mean, there was this assumption that this was going to look like every other development health program where some outsiders came in, promised an intervention, developed demand for it, and then deserted the whole country. Um, wouldn't fund it, wouldn't, you know, continue to support workers and things like that. And I think given the nature of HIV treatment um, and that you can't start and stop it and still have these, you know, drugs remain effective, um, that is lifelong treatment, there was what I think was due suspicion. And so some of the early, um, early and continued over three, auth three authorizations, three reauthorizations work with Congress from the beginning all the way through was this is a commitment. Like this is a lifelong commitment. In fact, it's sort of referred to politically as the mortgage, the pet farm mortgage um, under this. It was, and it was bilateral, bicameral, deeply embedded and owned commitment to not deserting once we'd started. And it took a lot then to build that sort of, I think, trust in, in each co collaboration to make that real. So I am worried that there, this battling over reauthorization is coming with a desensitization to that commitment, which could very much lead to a pulling back. Um, like everything PEPFAR, different motivations for what's going on for any political aspect of it. <laughs> And I'm sure there are some folks who maybe are tired of funding PEPFAR who are like, ha ha, let it be this like wild and crazy because that'll give us an off-ramp excuse at a much faster pace. I don't think that's the sole reason this is going on, but there's going to be a lot of them. So do I think the, the reality is that 
there is going to be massive pullback from from funding treatment. People will fall off, and people will fall off treatment. No, I don't. I do think there will still be enough mobilization, um, global response, and the global fund as well to make sure that doesn't happen. But it won't happen passively. That security can't be from inaction or just an assumption that it's a given that this won't collapse. Um, but more importantly, I think in, in every country, the folks who are left to reach are generally marginalized populations. They're not politically popular population, populations, including children. As much as we think of politicians kissing babies, they are not voting, they do not have a political vote, and very little actually gets done and invested proportionally on the crisis in children. And so part of the tragedy is we, we pull back as the US and we pull back as the globe before the job is done, it will have massive impact on the lives of particularly unpopular and unsupported people. And that's just crushing um, from a human a humanitarian, from a human rights perspective. I don't know if that was too wishy-washy, but. Uh, uh, uh. I just wanted to chime in. So Nina, until you just asked that question, I didn't even think about just going and, and you know, complete cut of the funding, and I don't know if those scenarios are being war gained, but there, you know, there's countries that you know some of the PEPFAR countries are middle income countries, and they uh, they would do better, and some are really low low income countries, and there's a you know a million dollars a day of PEPFAR funding in Uganda, um, so that uh, there would be it would vary from country to country and from population to population. Um, but just one thing that occurs to me is, you know, now with all of the disinformation and social media, and I, you know, I just saw a report from South Africa, and even now with, you know, very, very strong PEPFAR support, the level of trust and support for the U.S. and South Africa is not terribly high. And you can imagine, you know, people who are not friends of the U.S. just using even the uncertainty about it to, as a, you know, way of, of really, you know, undermining the U.S. as a, as what should be considered a trusted, until now, has been a trusted partner. So I also don't think the funding, it's going to go off a cliff. I, I don't think that's extremely unlikely, but the danger exists that it'll just dribble down. It'll just, because if no attention is paid to it, it what will happen is it'll just, I don't think there'll be an attempt to reduce it, but it'll just be reduced by default. And that's the biggest risk. Things will just be left and it'll just dribble down. And as Peter has said, add to the distrust that potentially exists in some countries and South Africa is a, an important one. Um, and add to that, which means that countries that may not be as friendly to the US will take advantage of that and uh, further stoke the satisfaction and and all the rest of it. So it doesn't serve anybody, well, it doesn't serve the US's interest, frankly, for anything like that to happen. In the short term, I don't think it's going to be, we're not going to go off a cliff, but we have to be aware of the medium and long-term consequences of this. Thing. Um, only because I went all downside and let me say upside to your youth audience, right? I mean, I think part of the message is there's never been a more important time for people in Tanzania, both to let their government know that they prioritize and care about HIV response and treatment, that they want it to be part of the core re bilateral relationship of what Tanzania is asking of U.S. diplomacy. Um, and then also realizing that as much as we advocate on this side, the youth voices who are affected matter tremendously to making the reality of that commitment. Thanks to Fogarty. We've had a lot of youth voices in our network, which is great. Um, so I wanted to think forward, forward thinking. You've all touched on how PEPFAR has led to more in, innovative and implementation science, collaborative team research. How do we move that forward? 
to try to reach the 2030 goals in this era of up for uncertainty. I think while we have, while our funding is still there, we still want to work more rigorously and aggressively with that. But I also think this is where Fogarty has a key role to play with NIH and other uh, institutes uh, of the NIH system in supporting those initiatives, and there are several, but in making sure those initiatives continue and are increased, enhanced, to be able to, to further the goal and, and to some extent fill in the gap. Cannot completely fill in the gap because of the amount of resource that's required, but I, I do think that would be something that one needs to think seriously about. And it has been gratifying to see over the years an increasing interest in implementation research across NIH, you know, domestically, um, the National Cancer Institute, uh, mental health, heart, lung, and blood, you know, all are really building up their implementation research, um, both in the U.S. and uh, internationally. It, it, just to reflect on something Godfrey said, if you, if you think about a, a sigmoid curve, you know, when you're going from 40 to 50 percent and that steep part of the curve, it's relatively, you know, relatively easy. It's the, the beginning is hard and then getting, you know, from 90 to 95, then it gets hard again. It takes a lot more resources and innovation. And that's really where that research is needed to get you get, you know, get, getting up from from 10 to 90 is relatively easy than getting from zero to 10 or from from 90 to 95. So important role for implementation research. Maybe just to add the history again that Godfrey started with, when I was senior scientific, scientific advisor to PEPFAR, um, my remit was targeted evaluation because we couldn't call it research. So it was very clear, it was targeted evaluation. And it was actually with, with NIH and with others, you know, we were starting this whole like then, what is implementation science? Because science and evidence-based are part and parcel of PEPFAR legislation. And that's why we called it, frankly, implementation science, not implementation research even. So, I mean, there's been a long history of like, you take the space, you do it right, you stay in compliance with the intention and the law, but also you're smart so you don't inflame the wrong things, right? I think part of also the sustainability of collaboration and research is to be very purposeful of not losing track of where we've been successful and had power in rapid translation of research results to new and innovative programs. Um, so not just having the results be more research as needed, not saying, awesome, we know treatment is a prevention now, go for it, US, we're still not going to fund for CD4s below, you know, above 250. No, 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 no. There has been a lot of success over the years in PEPFAR of having very non-traditionally shortcuts into scaled implementation of research results. It's not been perfect. Prep. Um, did not have that same massive push to successful broad scale implementation of pre exposure prophylaxis after it was started. PEPFAR didn't in, blocked investing in it. Um, point of care diagnostics to find those last babies who are infected early on and haven't been diagnosed as babies. Um, huge evidence that that works to find the hardest to find babies. That was not funded by PEPFAR. So I think there's also an element of researchers, not just for the program services being available as the background of the collaboration, but I think researchers have to have a voice, um, call it a scientific voice, an impact voice, or an ethical voice to say, this research finding demands investments for access and implementation. And that's a whole different angle for reasons to continue some of this funding that will appeal to different constituencies in a different way. Great points. Um, well, I know we have such an esteemed group of people here in the audience, so I'd also like to open it up for questions since we have about 13 minutes left. Um, so if you could please come to the microphone in the middle of the room and state your question. And I know we have a few people, you can get in line if you want. <laughs> Hi, um, Jordan Tam. I'm a professor here. Uh, thanks so much to all of you. A uh, question mainly directed to Shannon, but anybody's welcome to to chime in. Um, 
you know, one of the remarkable aspects of PEPFAR has been the maintenance of really strong bipartisan support for it over many years until this year, at least. And there's been a coalition of people who care about the program who I think have been important in maintaining that bipartisan support, administrators, experts, NGOs, advocates. What strategies um, do you think have been um, important to build political support for the program and maintain that support? And are those strategies still available today or is there a need to you know, do something different to, in particular, um, you know, get Republicans to uh, continue supporting the program? When, um... Gosh, um, I think some of the strategies in the past were implemented, but some were were not. Um, and then, you know, once you miss a window, you almost have to come up with brand new political strategies, right? Um, so there were some things that were more routine in past reauthorizations that maybe didn't get the same emphasis. Um, uh, making sure that the reauthorization was a top and urgent priority of the incoming administration or the new administration during private. There are other things going on. You know, it was clearly a higher um, priority for State Department this time to get the new Bureau for Pandemics approved than to have PIP for reauthorization on it. That's a sequencing thing. That's a timing thing. It's a messaging thing. We can't recover from that. We're in a new place. Um, once you escalate to a next, you know, level where it's become so politicized, you know, where is the bipartisanship um, successful? Well, the Senate still has complete bipartisan support for PEPFAR. So we're really talking about Congress and congressional uh, politics right now. Um, there are, uh, I would say the resistance to reauthorization is a handful of people. It's the exception, not the norm, but because of the politics of it, it becomes a big barrier. So I think, um, what has always been a tool is, you know, the volume control of how visible versus not visible the advocacy around reauthorization is or the actions of senators and Congress people around reauthorization is. Um, there was a great delegation, a Senate delegation to South Africa um, last spring, um, hosted by Elton John as well, was phenomenal, bipartisan, fully successful. They came back and had a Senate hearing that elevated the visibility. And it seems like that's when all the political buzz of people who are not in Congress, of Heritage Foundation, I was like, aha, this getting news, we should, this could be a thing to get news. So we can't de-escalate that. But it does say like, what's the right balance of escalating where and when? Is there a benefit? Is I mean, for me, I go, is this where a pop-off valve, a de-escalation of an omnibus bill, a continuing resolution, as opposed to a standalone PEPFAR authorization could do more good um, for the future. Because I think there is still a lot of bipartisan will, but there's just exceptions like we're seeing across Congress and some of the, the fights even within the Republican Party, right? But I wouldn't say it's a across the board D versus R status at all. I just want to comment on something that's come up in, in this discussion and over the years about the laser focus of PEPFAR on HIV AIDS and some of the complaints that have come about, you know, people even with HIV dying of hypertension or diabetes or cancer, and can't we add those services? And we've done some work around that, but then other, other uh, you know, people without HIV and people in the, other the health needs in the community. And I, I think it's actually been a very important strategy to keep that focus on HIV and to be able to talk about, you know, the 25 million people. And there's been this, a lot of collateral benefits as we talked about out of that. But if you went to Congress and said, you know, we need $6 billion for health system strengthening. Basket funding. Yeah. You, Never. You, and, and so that focus on HIV, although people, some people have complained about it, has been an important, important part of it. You know, people complain about silos. Um, this may be an Alan Greenberg ism that silos have a purpose. They keep your corn dry. And sometimes, sometimes having a silo is a, is a good strategy. Great. Hi, Caroline Quo. Uh, my work is mostly in Southern Africa on HIV. I want to return to this point that the panel made about the last five or 10% of, um, you know, kind of populations that are harder to reach. I think one of the major exciting benefits of something like PEPFAR is the ability to implement combination programs at scale. Um, you know, I think there are a few other financial players that are able to do that, like Global Fund. And 
one of the places where I think our implementation science has stalled or is needs development is around this area of how do we take efficacious evidence-based programs, what sequence should we combine them in to be cost efficient and effective to ramp up the effectiveness. And, but I don't think the NIH has really been necessarily great at the, the timeline and mechanisms needed to facilitate that scale of research, which is costly, which takes a lot of power and which takes a lot more time than the typical five-year timeline. So um, I'd love to hear um, if you're able to speak to it, what NIH's views are on investing in more combination implementation science and where you think that's going to go. Thank you. Good. Well, so I mentioned um, those earlier studies um, from five or so years ago, the pop art and, and search, um, which were, you know really did look at the combination, the, the, the community-based um, population level combination interventions. And so I'm not aware of that scale of work going on that was funded by, that was funded by PEPFAR. And um, that wouldn't be Fogarty with our small budget funding that kind of work. Um, we do, you know, mathematical modeling and some of the other work that could inform that, but I would be speaking for other institutes to, to really talk about what, you know, what is or isn't going on. Yes, I, first of all, I'm Paul Gaist. I'm from the NIH Office of AIDS Research, and thank you all. It's very nice to see everyone, and thank you for your presentations. Um, in full disclosure, you can tell from my title, I'm a government employee, so that filter is on me, so I truly appreciate, Shannon, your comment. Um, when you're presenting, I jotted a few notes down, but I thought it would be important also for context that, um, first of all, the NIH Office of AIDS Research is um, congressionally mandated, and it's the one entity at the NIH that's responsible for looking at the entire NIH HIV research program across the 27 institutes and centers. Every institute and center has a particular mission. And I wanna, and we're beginning to approach in terms of, um, Peter said about the overall NIH budget, but we're approaching $4 billion a year investment in HIV specifically. Um, and Peter made a comment about Fogarty, small size and small staff, but it has largesse in terms of its influence and impact in the HIV research program at NIH and beyond. And a lot of that has to do also with Peter's leadership. Um, I do not want to cut um, or, or minimize that really it is a family. It is a a whole group of institutes and centers that are trying to work together on a cohesive NIH research program. About PEPFAR, you know, we talk, we say money, 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 and it's important, but also, as you've emphasized, partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. And another former role, um, oh, within the NIH Office of AIDS Research, I'm responsible for the behavioral and social science research aspects of the NIH. HIV research program. Um, I've had a number of roles previously under Sandy Thurman. I was a science advisor for the Office of National AIDS Policy. And she emphasized and she really took pain to get to the minister, not only to the ministries of health, but to also Ministry of Education, Ministry of Defense, Ministry in different countries because it was all conceptualized as, well, that's the Ministry of Health that HIV and Ministry of Health often was one of the weakest ministries in the countries. But when you said, this has to do with your workforce, with your teaching staff, with your, and so partnerships are so important today in this moment, our community um, advocates, incredibly important. Um, and it's also about the, the trust that you touched on with the populations, that we're interacting and engaged with, and also the workforce capacity is taken, it's fragile. And so that has an impact, even when it stop, start, stop, start, that can be a real problem. Um, also PEPFAR, while not perfect, also put rules and guardrails on the investments that were being made that weren't there prior to PEPFAR that we would see money go in and not really be sure where it was going. 
right? PEPFAR helped to tighten that up. So I think that's another advantage and benefit. Um, Fogarty is also leading an effort at NIH um, and with many partners uh, for a special issue that are, is going to be coming out in BMJ Global Health on reciprocal innovation and reciprocal learning and multi-directionality. And, and this is also a benefit that PEPFAR contributes to that is that relationship of research uh, to PEPFAR as well. And I think um, to, to my last point is in terms of research to practice, yes, implementation science. Implementation science is necessary, but it's still part of the equation. Peter talked about health communication science uh, in the frame of disinformation, misinformation, malinformation. That has a lot to contribute. Health literacy of the populations. Well, it may, NIH has a research mission, but it doesn't mean we can't partner on what are the things that are important. And that health literacy really needs to include critical thinking and analysis skills at the earliest of ages because of the information um, explosion that has taken place, both good and not so good. And credible and not so credible. How do you make that differentiation? So I end with a question to the panel. How do we keep looking at the gaps and opportunities that PEPFAR has not only now, but what we see coming? Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. You know, simple question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm going to start with the the health literacy question and the communication, because I think in this era with social media and different channels of communication and different, you could say it's been democratized on the one hand that everybody now has a voice and can say whatever they want and, and so on. And this poses a challenge um, in terms of getting credible, credible information at the right time to the right people. Um, and so that is a whole gap and a field. Uh, I don't know what the current uh, situation is with regard to the health communication field. What I used to know is health education, health promotion. But we need to go very much more in terms of moving towards strategies and putting it in curriculum so that people will have the tools to deal with information critically. Um, and to me, that's a whole gap and a whole area that needs to be built out. How did I, I had a friend who would be quoting things to me about, well, I heard, where did you hear? I heard it on Facebook. It's like, well, you cannot take what you hear on Facebook at face value. And so what I was, what I used to say to her was look at other sources, at least at a minimum, is this a newspaper? Is it other sources beyond just the social media? You have to triangulate your source of information. This would be to me the simplest way of trying to figure out how credible this information is. But that whole area I think is a big gap and an important area to to do to deal with the information. So thanks, Paul, for your comments. And I think uh, part of our response would be to talk about a, a challenge um, that Ambassador Nkengasong is probably facing. That's the PEPFAR funding being quite extensive, um, but then this new responsibility around global security and diplomacy not being as well funded. And, but you can't take that focus off of the HIV because that's really where the advocacy is and where the funding is coming from. So uh, skillfully, you know, recognizing the collateral benefits and health system strengthening that has come as PEPFAR and how that really contributes to the pandemic preparedness and response um, will be part of the agenda for, for PEPFAR, for, for the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator, for John and Kengasong going forward. And uh, just related to that, so I was the Botswana country director for CDC in 2003 when PEPFAR started. 
and our our budget went from 10 to million to 20 to 40 to 80 million dollars so that was an exciting time uh the hiv prevalence was 37 percent 20 years ago um and now uh, botswana this year is one of the countries that has achieved 95 95 95 um with that support so you know Huge leadership from from Botswana, President Mohai at the time, um, but with that support from PEPFAR. But then that same Botswana Harvard laboratory has been doing very extensive HIV genomic surveillance, was activated for PEP, for um, SARS-CoV-2 genomic surveillance, and that's how Omicron was first recognized. So really that, that PEPFAR-funded capacity was part of that. And then similarly in, in West Africa, I was the then later in Zimbabwe and was the CDC team lead in Sierra Leone for the Ebola response in 2014. And in Zimbabwe, we had this health management information system and every clinic could send in text alerts for rabies or Ebola. And we had a laboratory system and specimen transport and a, a human resources information system, all these systems that have been developed with PEPFAR funding, and none of that was in Sierra Leone. They had a much lower HIV prevalence, and so the systems weren't there, and it was struggled. 11,000 people died from Ebola, and, and I, when I came back to Zimbabwe, I said, we're going to be okay. We've got all these systems in place that we can respond to this because of because of PEPFAR, but for Ambassador and Kengasong to you know, to just talk about that to keep the PEPFAR support going, but then also to fulfill those other roles is going to be a challenge. Maybe just one other thought. Um, processing your question and still fixated on combination, because uh, I was involved with BCPP and the combination prevention programs when I went back to UNAIDS, and these had been like sort of pushed under the carpet, no implementation. The conventional wisdom became like, you know, oh, they didn't work. Like they were as effective as a combinant, you know, partially effective vaccine. They actually did, you know, I mean, but so all sorts of, so trying to make sense of both of those, for me, part of it's a little bit less, what are the gaps left and what do we risk losing for research and innovation if we take our foot off the gas and meaning PEPFAR as part of that gas? Um, I think in the broader frame of health system strengthening, of traditional development health, as opposed to what we've seen for the HIV response. Um, this happens in UHC and primary care sort of rollouts. There has been a traditional momentum or rubric towards a one size fits all is what scale is. HEPFAR and the implementation science in particular surrounding the last 20 years challenged that and then actualized a different response than that. You know, implementation science was not a protocol that then stayed the same for five years. You learned as you went, and all of us have done the multiple IRP submissions for the next, you know, change in the protocol to make sure you get through even three years, you know, because you're learning as you go, you were changing programs as you you went, you were finessing the engine to get to the next effect. Um, I think this is the same of, you know, really we've seen this and the UNAIDS um, current targets. It's not just 95, 95, 95, but it's 95, 95, 95 for each specific differentiated, highly effective population, right? So that we don't lose the, the uh, we don't give in to the tyranny of the average, right? And so, but this idea that differentiation is scalable, and repetitive and that you can have agile and evolving interventions, not just the what, but the how, the for whom, the by whom, you know, is still incredibly unique, I would say, in global health and is not necessarily the language of health system strengthening, of UHC, of primary health care. So to me, the biggest fear is the remaining gap not necessarily in the HIV response, but the gap in taking these different approaches and different underlying philosophies and evidence of how to scale for quality, for impact, using new technologies and evolutions to the rest of health. And I don't know that there is momentum there. I almost think there's anti-momentum there if PEPFAR is not a player. said 
Thank you very much. I'm going to conclude because we're at time. So I just want to thank again, Shannon, Peter, and Godfrey for coming and for sharing your wisdom with the rest of us. We've learned a lot. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming today and sh sharing this time with us um, and thinking about PEPFAR. Um, I especially want to thank Alan Greenberg and the DCC FAR for supporting this event, Deanna Kerrigan and Wendy Davis for, for their work on it, and Allison and Alice for helping us to coordinate. So thank you very much.